Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Som TV Podcast. My name is Jason Wise. On today's pod, we are going to talk about that delicious and very perplexing green spirit known as absinthe. We're going to talk about its history, its controversies, and why occasionally you wake up in a bus stop somewhere five towns away after drinking it. On today's pod, I have Amanda Sasser, the great bartender owner of Cantiki Bar here in Los Angeles, which is absolutely a place you need to go if you're in LA. It's the only place you need to go in LA. Uh, before we get to that conversation, though, I do want to say, obviously, subscribe to Som TV. SomTV.com has hundreds and hundreds of hours of the best educational and entertaining content you can get in the food and wine world. That's over at SomTV.com. Amanda, welcome back to the Som TV podcast. I uh, I did this. I arranged this entire thing just so I could talk to you again. Really? Oh my gosh, frankly. I'm so honored. It's always fun to chit chat. <laughs> well, we've talked about you know some of the great drinkers, and hopefully, we get to do that more. But this is uh, we're actually going to talk about a spirit, and absinthe is sort of one of these things that I think conjures up a lot of very false and maybe deserved thoughts when you think about this. You know. I, False and deserved. <laughs> I, I know it sounds weird, but but if you think of absinthe, you, th- you think of French painters, you think of some hallucinatory thing, you think of history and um, imbibing in something that breeds art, kind of. Of course, yeah. That's that's greatly what because you know absinthe was such a. Um, It wasn't for just the elitist, you know, absinthe was easy to get for a while and it became this almost bohemian sort of like magic potion that everybody felt like made them more creative. You know, they say that Van Gogh like, you know, cut off his ear because of it. And there's all this folklore around it, even down to the, you know, the little green fairy, which, you know, we might get into this later, which is a great marketing technique actually for absinthe. (laughs) Yeah, right. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Well, let me just basically, we'll start it off with, what the hell is absinthe? You know, what what actually is it? Yeah, so absinthe, you know, there's a, a little bit of a misconception. I think a lot of people think absinthe is a liqueur um, because it does uh, contain, it's a maceration of herbs. However, absinthe is a highly alcoholic liquor. So its base is brandy for the most part. Um, you know, it, it can be beet Uh, beetroot, it can be um, wheats and grains, but mainly you use brandy. And it's just distilled at a higher ABV. And it it contains, though, it has to contain the holy trinity, is what they call it, of wormwood, fennel, and anise, anise. So Um, Absinthe has to contain these things um, in their first distillation. And then going from there, different, you know, different absinthe distillers and different makers of this can add herbs and spices additionally to that. Well, I, I, you know, for me, let me just ask you flat out because I love this stuff. Do you like absinthe? It's a very strong thing. I do. I mean, you have to kind of like licorice. You have to like those very bitter flavors. Uh, In my opinion, the more bitter, the better. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think absinthe is so, it's so unique and so exciting for your palate that it's really fun to drink. I wonder how many people have actually had real absinthe and thought they were, because it's not, real absinthe is very different than like, you know, sometimes you can find absinthe at a liquor store or something like that, but oftentimes it's not truly real absinthe. And before we get into kind of the history What's the difference between, because it's not regulated in the way that a lot of spirits are. It's not like you can call vermouth and it really is totally something different. What is real absinthe versus fake absinthe, I guess? Real absinthe has to contain those three elements. Um, It has to be distilled with brandy. It shouldn't have any necessarily additional sugars in it. It shouldn't have any, um, any, you know, there are these stories about how um, whenever it was, uh, made illegal, people would doctor it with like weird pesticide-y sort of things so you could get that flavoring. Um, I don't think any of that's like on the shelves today, but I would say if you're, you could potentially be selling something as an absinthe that is really a pastis, um, which, you know, when it was banned, Pernod 
took over and they they did this non um, non thujone containing non wormwood containing liqueur and they called that pastis and so and that has a very similar flavor profile but it doesn't contain the grand wormwood. Well, I, this is a perfect transition because I want to talk about wormwood. So first of all, I love that name. It's like an it's like a villain in Lord of the Rings <laughs> or uh, you know some Harry Potter character. Wormwood, it's. It's a very wrong name because it's neither from worms nor is it from wood. What What is wormwood? So it's a very bitter, very, very bitter herb. Um, and this is just conjecture, but it was used medici- medicinally um, back in like the 1500s. I mean, the, the, the Egyptians and Greeks, and they were using wormwood to get rid of tapeworms. Um, in in the body. So it, that's that's where it originated from. So it probably got the name kind of from that, but I don't have any proof whatsoever <laughs> that that actually <laughs> no, that happened. Sounds, that sounds pretty logical. I, I, uh, my connection with this is that when I, just a quick like personal thing, when I got engaged, I was in New Orleans and absinthe was very difficult to find in the United States. It's now much easier, mm-hmm. but there was some absinthe coming in from the Czech Republic and there was this Ooh. bar and it was kind of like a secret and it was in New Orleans and like you could get real absinthe and you weren't supposed to know about it. I don't even think it was actually illegal at that point. It was just more of like a, a novelty. And we found this place and I will say about absinthe, I don't know that it has any hallucinatory actual qualities to it, the way that it gets credit. It definitely gets you drunk though. I mean, it's 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 heavy. It hits. It does. Well, I think anything gets you drunk, but I do personally find, and I think it depends on one's body chemistry. If I'm drinking things with a lot of herbs and spices in them, it, it hits a different way. Um, you almost get an excitability and then you kind of just get like this dizzy spell. It's different than, than drinking just a sort of a pure spirit. And, and I really do think it's kind of the, the like sugar breakdowns, the way the herbs happen in your body, because, you know, They've also kind of leaked. I, I talked linked. I talked about Thujon. Um, Thujon has the same sort of chemical properties as THC. So if you think about that, and you're getting now, you're just getting small trace elements of that that one compound in in your um, your absinthe. Um, you, Thujon's found in sage. It's found in rosemary. Like you know, you would have to have a ton of this stuff to actually hallucinate. But I do think that the the way your body breaks down these properties, everything hits different, you know, and it's yeah. fun. Like absinthe is fun. <laughs> absinthe is fun. So how would you how would you describe the kind of, I guess, buzz from real absinthe? I would say because the preparation from absinthe, you are supposed to dilute it. That's it's a high alcohol. It's a high liquor. And when you drink it, you're supposed to dilute it with at least, you know, two to three parts chilled water to, you know, an ounce or two of absinthe. Um, And you have those little absinthe glasses and they measure it out perfectly and you can fill it to the top. So honestly, this was a drink that some people, like you you could start your morning with it because it just sort of, like an energizer, like, you know, just like a green juice or something. So I would say it kind of makes you in a lot of ways hyper alert and very excited. Unfortunately, that can lead to more drinking, which I think is probably can or does yeah, the I think. biggest culprit. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the history of of absinthe and sort of where it came from. I think it's very interesting that it, from what I can find, Switzerland is sort of the culprit here. Yep. In creating this drink, and as we know about the Swiss, they're very. I hate to use the word precise, but they are. I mean, the things that they make are very very well done. They do not skimp on how they create stuff. And I'm surprised that the Swiss have not completely and totally done what Champagne has done with this because, frankly, I think Absinthe got a bad name from being made other places and being made not so well, um, mm-hmm. at least from a from a taste standpoint. I'm not talking about mm-hmm. the actual effects of it. What can you tell me about the history of Absinthe and kind of how it came about and where it came from? Well, it originated in a town called Cuvée in Switzerland. Interestingly enough, a French uh, doctor who was fleeing the uh, Revolutionary War came over, landed in Cuvée, and uh, his name was Dr. Pierre Ordinaire, which I think that's, he sounds amazing. I imagine him like flying in, you oh, know, <laughs> he just 
great name. And um, he started working on this and uh, this absinthium, and it had at least 15 different um, botanicals in it. And he bottled it again as an elixir. When he died, it is rumored that he left his recipes to, I've heard nuns, or I've heard the Henriad sisters. Um, and it's said that like some people believe that they were already making this and he like stole it. So I kind of dig thinking also that absinthe was actually created by nuns <laughs> because what else do they have to do? But like, you know, <laughs> pray. Praise the, yeah, pray and make elixirs. So that's kind of where that's, that's the history of absinthe. It was also really easy to make because brandy was so available. Um, and all of these herbs were really available. So it kind of was, um, a, a a liquor that could be replicated. You, you had the goods, you had the goods to make it. I think about this time, I think it's a really fascinating thing. The whole world is about to explode. And I mean, it culminates in world war one, but between between the war with Fran the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 and World War I is where so much of our modern fears, anxieties, but a lot of our art movements and things came out of. If you think about it this way, marijuana is legal. Cocaine mm. is not – cocaine's like a vitamin then. I mean, people are <laughs> like – you know, opium and laudanum and all of these things are like prescribed for a – you know, you have, a, you have a slight cough. Well, here's some opium. Here's some laudanum. And it's funny that – as this goes through, one by one, these different things are either cherry-picked or rightly so regulated very heavily. And I think it's interesting that absinthe found itself in this category of things that were creating malicious behavior. I really can't find any actual historical real effects that absinthe had. It's not like it, you know, I think if people are going to go out in the street and brawl with each other, I mean, you might as well get rid of beer at that point. Sure. I think, I think absinthe its effects in this time period seem to be a lot of interesting, strange art. A lot mm -hmm. of, um, you know, w what do you think? Because we'll get to the point in 1914 when they actually, they dropped the hammer and that uh, coincidentally is when World War I started, which is interesting. Why, why, why do you think absinthe got locked into these like serious need to ban drug level things? I, I mean, I think it's it's like with anything, uh, you anything sort of artistic that could possibly make some rich, wealthy, hoity-toity, you know, super conservative group feel nervous about giving and people having more power and freedom and action. And you know, one thing about spirits is they do you know, reduce our inhibitions. They, they make us, you know, sometimes you, I, sometimes I'm like, if you want to know the truth about anything, just give me a shot of alcohol, you know, and then they don't, I'll tell you, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't need anything but that. But I, I think it's like, it, you know, art and expression was so, it was so accepted in a place like France, Right. And then you get to all these European countries and maybe it's a little bit more accepted, but then you get to the U S and maybe we're a little bit slower on the, on the sort of free spirit sort of situation. But I really think it's just an uncomfortability level. And I, and I also think it all comes down to money too and where where the bucks are going and anything that you feel like you maybe can't regulate and then you can regulate, you can make right. money off of it. I wonder if there's something too, not to get too, uh, too sociological here, but I wonder if there's something with the class system thing here too. Because at this time, you've got communism raging in Europe. You've got, you know, basically the art the art movement at the time was very political. I mean, mm -hmm. everything was, you know, it, it had a political conjecture behind it. And so it was oftentimes you had painters and poets and writers and you had a lot of women entering the space and actually having their voices heard. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we're, we're, we're literally talking about a period where women in a lot of countries didn't even have the right to vote. Right. And so... It's crossed with the temperance movement. They're trying mm -hmm. to ban alcohol all over the world. They succeeded here in the U.S. And so I wonder if the confluence of all of these different things put absinthe on a stage. I mean, there's one event in 1905 that I'll, I'll mention. I think it's total horseshit, but I'll mention it. In 1905, there's a Swiss farmer named Jean Lafray. He murdered his family <laughs> right. and then attempted to kill himself. This is like such... This is like such like fear-mongering type stuff. You always have this one event that people can lean to and go... This is the thing. 
Right. And apparently he was drinking absinthe when he killed his family and killed him and tried yeah. to kill himself. And so everybody pinned that on it. And But what they don't say is that he had been on like a three-day drinking binge. He'd had like seven or eight liters of wine, couple of beers. You know, he had been, he was on a tear. He had been drinking for a very long time. And he was but, probably an asshole too. I mean, <laughs> He was the sweetest guy ever. He just needed a break. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm sure that's, uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> when this stuff happens, I always, it's always, it takes like a hundred or more years for us to collectively look in the mirror and go, why did we do that? And of course, like you said earlier, money's always a factor. Mm -hmm. And so when absinthe got banned and it went country by country, strange right. places, it's like, you know, you look at like the Congo in Africa banned, right. you know, which... You know, I don't want to get into the, the 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 Belgians and stuff in the Central Africa and why that probably was the place that it got banned. I'm sure they didn't <laughs> want people uh, doing anything free then. But anyways, it, it's it's it just sort of domino affected across Europe and of course the U.S. and and Canada and all these other places started banning it. And I think it's by attrition. It just sort of happened one after another after another after right. another. And there's no there's no real hard science into why and the ramifications or not uh, reasons to ban it, I guess not why, but reasons to ban it. And so the ramifications are really fascinating. N everybody started chasing other anise drinks. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted that taste and that flavor still. And so you have the rise of Pestis, mm -hmm. which is an anise drink in France that I happen to really enjoy. You have Ouzo in Greece. Mm -hmm. You have Reiki in, in uh, Turkey. You have all these different drinks that sort of popped up and they were around, but they became very, very, very popular. And sure. Some of and the biggest then don't forget Iraq as well. Iraq oh, yeah, is Iraq. delicious. It is. I just it had is. some recently and I was like, I haven't had this in a long time. It's so good. And it is funny if you get into these anise drinks, anise drinks, however you pronounce it, they, they are very different one from the next, from the next, from the mm -hmm. next. And some of them are quite sweet. There's Sambuca, which is more licorice, you know, right. if you want to really get into it. But, but the, but, I find these to be very, very interesting and so of a place. And every country claims they invented the idea of doing this. If you go to Greece, they invented it. If you go to Turkey, they invented it. If you go to, you know, it's just sort of how it works. But some of the biggest companies that exist today, I mean, you look at Pernod. Now, Pernod makes an anise drink that is incredibly popular. And Pernod Ricard is one of the biggest companies in the spirits world now. They're a conglomerate. And they rose because of this. They totally did. And if I have my facts correct, actually, one of the Pernod family married the Pierre Ordinaire guy that we were speaking, uh, his daughter. And that's how they came into connection with this anise flavored liquor, which is wild. You know, and they were just like, oh, we got an idea for this. Let's take this and run with it. Let's go. Yeah. And make money it money yeah. drives. But <laughs> also, drives it, it's. When they when they made it illegal, that was Pernod's answer was to take the wormwood out of it and sell it, and they made it one of the most popular beverages in France because they could do it. They had the money to do it, and they did it. And now we have amazing pastis. Which do you like? Do you prefer absinthe to a pastis? Or you know, it depends. If if absinthe is served, and we should we should talk about how it's served a little mm -hmm. bit. It conjures up the image of you know, putting it, dripping it through a sugar cube into water and all of that stuff. D do you like it in that fashion? Because I, I believe there are two ways to have absinthe. And one is, have you ever seen like the frappe version where they do it with ice? Yes. yes. Yeah. So let's, how do they serve absinthe? We should just Which, backtrack. So traditionally it is served, like I said, in a, in a cute little glass that looks a lot like an old school kind of sherry glass with maybe a taller nose, a taller uh, flute situation going on um, and a wider top. And then there's a little like tank sort of in the bottom where you fill your absinthe up. And then you're supposed to put like a slotted spoon or something um, there with a little sugar cube on it and then filter ice water through that. So it's actually, which I think is kind of cool and I appreciate this. There's a ceremony with absinthe, which I think is um, a lot of why it was so popular at 5 p.m. after you got off work. It was the ceremony that you would do with friends, the green hour, you know, and you would, you have to sit there and you have to wait for the water to filter into your glass and you're probably having amazing conversation and you're, you know, you're probably just like, you're getting excited and you're watching um, this absinthe. Absinthe change colors. 
You know, right. so that's one thing is the absence is supposed, to, is supposed to get cloudy at the bottom. And then sometimes it'll have a little hue on top of it, depending on what kind of absinthe that you're drinking, but it always should be cloudy. Um, and then you just, you just sip on it or you slosh it back, you know? And again, some people like more water, some people like less. Um, some people do one-to-one. Uh, I prefer, I think two-to-one is what I prefer because, you know, as I get older, I can't really handle, I need, I need all the dilution I can get, but I don't, <laughs> I don't want to take away from the flavor of the spirit because it, yeah. it does have so many unique layers that that makes it really fun to drink. Well, back to your pastis question. I mean, for me, when I, I filmed quite a bit in Paris and I, I find myself there often, which is very lucky. Pastis has become a thing for me that is like Beaujolais in Paris. You know, I'm there, mm. I want it, and I have it often. I don't tend to have it here at home, but when I'm in France, I have it all the time. So I don't often, I'm, I'm rarely if ever offered absinthe in Paris. But pastis has become such a, it's at every cafe. It's, you know, if you'll go to a cafe and they'll have four drinks on it. Get a glass of Chablis, get a glass of Beaujolais, which often they'll just put as white or red. And, you know, there'll be a pastis and then there'll be some form of a cocktail. And that's yeah. like it sometimes, you know, as far as options go. You've got all so, your, your major uh, food groups, if you will, you know. <laughs> you've that's right, got yeah. Chablis. Your starter, your middle, you've got your digestif, and then, you know, if you want a cocktail before or after, you've got that. That's all you need. That's right. No, that's Sometimes right. Sometimes I think we have too many options. <laughs> we, I, I think always. Anybody who's ever looked at a, a damn wine list knows exactly what you're talking about. It's like, I need 29 suaves. No, you don't. Um, <laughs> so anyways, so when it when it comes to the, the preparation of it, I... I tend to, I tend to like foregoing the sugar cube. Honestly, mm-hmm. I, I I I like it with a, a a mix of water. But then again, some absinthe is, some absinthe is sweet. You know, it already comes pretty sweet, which For is unfortunate sure. because I, I wish Americans would get the chance to try the real stuff, and yeah. it's not always common. You know? Yeah, I mean, my my favorite absinthe. I I did the cocktail program for a French bistro, so I got I got really into absinthe and and you know it was just it opened it was such a fun exciting world. But I I also like the more bitter. You know, I the bit more bitter the better. Um, I don't particularly need a sugar cube either, but I like to try things classically as they were as they're supposed to be prepared. So I think, again, the ceremony of it's really fun. I do have to say one should never light the the sugar cube on fire. That was more sort of invented as a gimmick or a show. And, you know, you would usually douse the sugar cube in absinthe and light it on fire, which I have done before. But anytime you're adding fire or heat to something, it evaporates the alcohol. So what's the point, you know? Right, right. You're just drinking sugar. Yeah. <laughs> Really, at that point. <laughs> so there's this big modern revival with it, and and do, you know, do do you do you remember when absinthe sort of came back a little bit for you? Well, I mean, it was it wasn't legal in the U.S. until 2007. So I mean, that's that blows my mind. You know that this is something that we couldn't really get our hands on. I mean, legally until 2007, and absinthe really didn't. When I started designing cocktails is when absinthe really came into play for me personally because it has such a unique property, unique flavor properties, and it's in so many of the classic cocktails. And I don't know if we want to go into, you know, I don't know if we want to go into that yet, but that's when it really began for me because I was always more of a of a a liqueur sort of after dinner cordial cordial amaro person. But what I do like about absinthe and pastilles is they they kind of are like a palate cleanser too. They they kind of like they they zhuzh you up a little bit and they don't they don't um I, t- I was about to say something that I would take back, but they they do kind of numb <laughs> your tongue in a fun way, but I don't feel like they mute your palate as much as some of these other things do. I I, I do going back to what you said earlier, agree though. The problem with one absinthe is you have two. You too. And, uh, I, I learned. Uh, I learned on a, a trip. My wife and I went to Breckenridge after we had our first child. And we we're like, we w- we haven't gone skiing in a, a decade, and we're like, this is our one chance. We went skiing. We we're at altitude, and we went to an absinthe bar, and we had a few of them between the next ski round. Ooh. And I will tell you, 
that stuff hits real hard when you're up in the mountains and you're in the cold and you're like, oh, you know, this, it just goes down so easy and it's so wonderful. I will tell you, we stumbled out of that place at about 1 p.m. and looked at each other and we're like, so we're going to bed now? Because it was was not, uh, altitude will get you when it comes to that stuff. (laughs) Oh, I imagine. So what what cocktails do you do you traditionally use ab- absinthe in? You're a perfect person to talk to. About well, probably this. the the one that most people know is the New Orleans style Sazerac, and it it is just an absinthe rinse. That's the other beautiful thing about absinthe is you really don't use. There are very few recipes where you use a ton of absinthe. You know, you're you're going to do a rinse, you're going to do a, a bar spoon, you're going to do 0.25. There's a couple of cocktails that you really like that you know that will that call for an ounce to an ounce and a half of that. But the Sazerac without the absinthe is just kind of boring. You know, I mean, you really need that wormwood sort of musty, like sort of bitter finish. And, and you, you smell it first and then it changes the whole flavor of your drink because of you're smelling all these botanicals. Um, and in a lot of ways, the absinthe really smooths out that cocktail which is nice where it would be, you know, more like drinking, you know, rye and cognac with a little bitters on the rocks, you know, and a sugar cube kind of more like an old fashioned. The absinthe actually makes it an experience, which is very cool. And then you have, I know right now, this moment, I want one of those right Right? now. (laughs) Right. It sounds, it sounds so good. Um, And then you've got death in the afternoon, which, you know, your traditional absinthe and champagne, which I think is probably the most dangerous combination (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because if you add bubbles to anything, um, it increases your uh, your drunkenness from the aeration from the bubbles. And again, I don't have any scientific proof of this, but I I believe it because I this, can't. This this is a get you naked quick drink. It's I question. mean seriously. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the other cocktail, which is is something that became very, very popular over the last, you know, probably seven years is the Corpse Reviver number two, where you've got lemon, you've got gin, you've got either a Coqui Americano or a Lille Blanc in there, and you've got um, your absinthe rinse. And that drink is delicious. And it's on a lot of brunch menus. Um, I had it on one of my brunch menus and I remember making this for people thinking, I know how their day's going to go. This is, <laughs> this is going to be... <laughs> this is going to be fun. Like that's what that's what they're in for. <laughs> oh my god! I, I really, I actually think I have to go and uh, and and come into your bar and have you make like ten of these for me right now. And that's how my day is going to go. Totally, uh, anytime, without a question. So where 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 would you recommend somebody starts with that with absinthe? I mean, how do you it, I, to the person that's maybe never had it or only tried it in some you know random situation? Where where do you start with absinthe? I think that if you are a person that enjoys a particular cocktail or a particular type of spirit, like if you do like, you know, um, whiskey or cognac, try a Sazerac because that's going to be the most, it's not going to overwhelm you, but you're going to be able to taste, uh, to taste the absinthe no matter what and kind of decide if you like it. But I do really feel that you should always taste a spirit first in its, in its purest form, just as is, you know, and I know a lot of times you can go to bar, which it, that's easier for me. Cause I, I, you know, pick spirits to go on my, my menus and everything and in, in, in my programs, but you can go to any bar for the most part and probably ask somebody like, can I have a little taste of that? Just like a tiny little taste. And I never mind because it's so exciting to watch somebody experiencing a flavor that they've never had before. And then it strikes up a conversation and that's the whole sort of alchemy, in my opinion, to imbibing and, and to spirits. I would say if you're ever lucky enough to be in a place that has one of those big ornate absinthe fountains, run up there and order you an absinthe because there's really no more decadent way to experience um, that, that liqueur in the spirit. Uh, so, Do you just, have one of those? I don't. I don't have one. You know, and there's a lot of little things that you can buy. Like you can buy almost like, you know, how you make solo coffees, slow drip. You can buy a little topper where it holds the ice in the water and it, and it trickles down over the sugar cube. You can buy those, I think off of Amazon for pretty, 
cheap. Um, The absinthe fountain, it's more the, you know, it was more at the bar. It was more like, where would I put it? And also they can be, you know, they can have a a little bit of a price tag. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure. I mean, some of those antique ones, they go for thousands and thousands of dollars and they're beautiful. Yeah. They really are. But you, but you often find that stuff at places that are dedicated to it. I mean, you, you right. know, the term absinthe bar exists for a reason. You have to be, you know, you have to maintain that thing. You have to have enough absinthe to uh, to do it. Totally. And uh, you don't norm, you don't see that at the TGI Fridays. It's not, it's not a common. It's interesting. Absinthe isn't one of those liquors that is asked for a whole lot in the U.S. In my experience, you know, it, it really now for tiki cocktails, we will put um, absinthe in in some of those because it is a it is a, an ingredient that is prevalent in a lot of tiki cocktails but it's not asked for on its own very often so i feel like it's something because of all the misconceptions that people are probably a little afraid of that maybe don't know that you're not going to you know go wild crazy and and kill your family yeah right or cut your ear off or uh, do something yeah. like that yeah, at some point I'm going to stumble into your bar with a beret on and uh, um, and, a, and a fake and a fake ear cut off, and order an absinthe and uh, and <laughs> you'll know it's me. Let's right just away. get that on film. I'll make sure we have to make sure the camera's That's great. rolling. Well, I would I would say judging by our conversation, absinthe is criminally underrated and needs a little more respect here in the U.S. And uh, you know, we missed Absinthe Day, which was a couple weeks ago, but. It, right. We're better late, better late than never. I mean, it's amazing. There's a day for everything at this point. Every like day's absinthe day. day. Every day's absinthe day. So I want everybody to go out and try, seek out a good bottle of absinthe or a taste of it and try to enjoy it the right way and have a good conversation while you're doing it. I have a couple of recommendations. Okay, if anyone listening um, wants to try, you know, I, St. George, which is a, a, a California-based company, they make some amazing spirits. They have a really great absinthe. Um, it is a little sweeter. and do have a baby bottle here that we keep on our bar. They've got the little monkey on the label. Um, they do use probably about 10 to 12 botanicals in there, like wormwood and hyssop and mugwort. But it's a really great absinthe. Um, it, it, it It's easy to drink. It's not going to, you know, punch you in the face so much, but it, it does have all those flavors. And then my, one of my favorites is Duply uh, Vert, which that actually is a little bit more greener of a hue. A hue. Um, I do not have a bottle of that, but it is, it's, it's got this really bitter backbone to it that I really appreciate. And it's not quite as sweet. Um, the bottle's gorgeous. Like I said, I wish I had some, but I think I drank my say, way say through. The name, say the name again. It's, it's Duplay, Duplay Vert. So it is a little green. And the other cool thing about absinthe that, you know, when you read from these companies that tell their story, absinthe is very uh, sensitive to light because it does have so many plant properties in it. Um, so the color will change uh, from sort of bottling till it gets to you. The color will change just a little bit, uh, which I think is super cool. So you're almost like, ooh, I don't know what I'm going to get. And you should always store absinthe in a darker place. Um, you know, you can keep it in the fridge if you want to keep it chilled, but never set it out in the sunlight because that does damage. That's a lot of times why it's um, it's mailed in these green, green kind of more light sensitive bottles. It's, it sort of turns yellow, right? Like yeah. almost like it loses its color, like from yeah. a green to a yellow. And that's not, not as appetizing, I guess, maybe of a color though. I will say chartreuse yellow is pretty, pretty tasty. Oh um, yeah. Well, this has been uh, this has been a lot of fun, Amanda. I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm I'm now, you know, gonna go find some absinthe in the middle of the day. <laughs> I feel I wish I didn't have to work all night tonight because all I want to do is just go sip on some absinthe. <laughs> That's right. Well, and then go paint. But all right. <laughs> Well, thank you, Amanda. Everybody needs to, when you're in Los Angeles, you have to check out uh, Cantiki, which is one of the greatest bars here in Los Angeles. Amanda, I want to thank you again thank for you. Uh, being on the Psalm TV pod. It's always a pleasure. Um, we need to talk about some great drinkers again. Yes, uh, yes, Historical definitely. drinkers. On an episode coming up, we'll do that. Everybody, we have all new episodes on Psalm TV. There's a brand new Behind the Glass live right now on the seven-year journey of creating Ross Knoll Vineyard. This was a monster to film, and I hope you really enjoy it. The woman behind it put everything she had into creating this vineyard. I've never seen anything like it. So that's on SomTV.com right now. Subscribe. It's only $49.99 for an entire year, which uh, is a good deal, if you want my opinion. 
All right, everybody, please be safe. And if you're going to drink absinthe, don't do it while driving. Do it at a nice cafe. And uh, and if you are doing it, text me because I'd like to join you. All right, be safe, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>